We will talk about uh, speed, uh, speed in architecture, and especially the difference in speed between Asia, uh, Europe, and the United States, uh, places where we all uh, worked and where we had experience. To start uh, very dryly uh, with uh, just a definition of speed. Uh, speed uh, is based on distance and time. And you could translate distance for architects in space uh, because in the end, architects are space planners. And we, do, we plan spaces that people can use. We plan spaces that people can uh, use for their own creation and imagination. Um, we're not much more than that. Um, in the first uh, book, Adolf Loos wrote, uh, he uh, made already the connection between space and, and time, and he uh, discussed uh, the situation of uh, the influence of time on the outcome of the planning. It's actually a very interesting uh, statement, because at that moment of time, uh, there were not many procedures for modern architecture yet. And he tried to invent uh, a system uh, where he could play with time and with speed in his architecture proposals. One of the famous proposals is, of course, the proposal for the museum in New York, uh, which was a column uh, which he wanted to build in just over three years, uh, which was then, of course, very, very fast. And uh, he could only do that by proposing to do it in full concrete. Um, in China, um, the place where we work at the moment, or where our practice in both Hong Kong and Beijing have a lot of assignments, uh, speed is also very important, and especially the speed of development and the speed of construction. Um, as you are probably all well aware of, is that the population of China is uh, growing very, very rapidly. We all know that there are already many Chinese in the world, but that they become more and more and also their importance and their economical importance becomes more and more. But to keep up with a kind of this growth of the population, China, of course, needs to also develop extremely fast, and the building also needs to go extremely fast. If you compare uh, that speed uh, of construction and also the spending that is related to that speed uh, with Europe, and with the United States, uh, you can see this graph. Uh, the US is already behind uh, compared to China, and the EU uh, is uh, still keeping up. Um, but now uh, you know that we have the double dip, as everybody says it. Uh, all our uh, leaders in the European Union are talking about it. Uh, and this is uh, a prediction uh, based on that double dip, and that also the EU will soon uh, be passed uh, by China. And if you look at it more carefully, just look at the residential uh, planning and the residential expansion in China, you see that it is 10 times as much as it was 10 years ago each year which are figures uh, that have never been seen before anywhere in urban development in the world, also not in the Middle East uh, about 10 years ago. This brings all kinds of social issues, cultural issues, uh, but also the issue between city, uh, village, and uh, landscape, or hinterland, uh, if you uh, would say. Um, because a city is nothing without a an hinterland, and is nothing without the support. Uh, of what is around it. It is, of course, also very clearly related uh, to the uh, GDP development uh, of each part uh, of the world. Uh, last 10 years, this is an average over the last 10 years, 10.5% uh, annual uh, GDP raise, and US just 1.7 and EU 1.8. So very moderate development versus very fast <coughs> development. If you look to the percentage uh, of construction change, or the amount that is applied to it, uh, you can see also that China and India are developing uh, that figure uh, the fastest. And if you see uh, that in 2010, already almost 40% of all construction in the world uh, took place in Asia. And in 2020 or 2025, it will be 50% of all construction in the world that takes place in Asia. 
that is pretty dramatic and that's an unbelievable change in the thinking and it's also an unbelievable change for the West uh, to cope with and to compete with. Um, to put it in a perspective, uh, 40 billion square meters of GFA are planned up till 2030 just in mainland China. That is 10 times the size of Manhattan and everything that is on it, uh, which is uh, pretty significant. Um, if you then look at the speed uh, for the buildings itself uh, that they can develop, um, these are just examples from already uh, three to four years ago. Um, an example in Shenzhen, I want to point out because it's almost next to our stock exchange. Uh, build uh, the Daiwan Plaza uh, was 2.75 days per floor, uh, and then it was realized. It's 55 floors, so you can understand how fast that building was realized. At the moment, 60% of the elevators produced in the world uh, find their final destination in China. About 55% of the cement uh, that we use in the world is used in China. That also says something about the way in China building is developed. It's a very modern technique based. Uh, the, the old authentic way in China was building a lot with wood. Currently, uh, that is exchanged by different materials. And of course, uh, construction and speed in construction is related to money. Um, and there, where there is money, there are also dangers of uh, corruption. If you look at uh, China, uh, about one third of every corruption case that is uh, in court uh, is related to land use or to construction, which is uh, a very um, challenging and difficult thing for the country to overcome. Nevertheless, you can easily say uh, that China really uh, took off and that we are uh, left behind. Uh, this is an image that we used uh, in the presentation uh, for one of our projects to explain to the client uh, that going fast is extremely uh, good and that you can also try uh, to establish uh, development in a very fast and energetic way but that you also always have to look at the construction of what is happening uh, and that you really take care that it will also fly um, and not only uh, shoot up in the air and explode afterwards. You could also use another metaphor and uh, look at speed uh, related to trains in 2000. Uh, there, Japan and France were way ahead. China was uh, related to uh, kind of the US. Um, this is the development in 2011. There was a little bit of development in Japan and a little bit of development in Europe, uh, none in the US, but uh, China is already uh, keeping up. And uh, what will be the future might be uh, this, uh, that China uh, goes out of sight. It's a, a metaphor uh, for what might happen with building uh, as well. It all started in the first tier cities of China, which were Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, uh, the cities that were marked for specific development, economic development, more free development than the communistic uh, approach that they had uh, uh, along for about 30 years. Um, and OMA participated in that development by uh, a plan that we made uh, for uh, Sh uh, Shenzhen. Uh, it's called the Chin High Development. Um, we were asked to plan 1,600 hectares, and if we talk about speed, that plan had to be delivered in five weeks, uh, and then uh, had to go into schematic and implementation phase in another three and a half months, which is, of course, unbelievable, and if you really try to understand what that means for a development of a city, uh, about 16 square kilometers are planned in five weeks, you can understand that these cities, first-tier cities, uh, need to be rooted in their context to be able to keep up uh, with this uh, enormous challenge. So what we proposed was to not erase everything that was already on the site, which often <coughs> happens in China, but to really literally take stripes of the existing and just plan in between the existing so that you could connect uh, the new uh, to the old and to the history of a city that grew over 30 years. 
Um, this is the model that you will also see in the progress exhibition uh, upstairs. Uh, we presented it as a computer board uh, to our client uh, to simulate uh, also the speed of this development, but also the flexibility it needs to have to be able to adapt uh, over time, but also to be able to adapt during the planning stages. If you have only five weeks, you can't plan up to the detail. Uh, you need to leave things open and blank. Currently, China is developing their second tier cities in a very uh, rapid way. Also there, OMA participated. Uh, we made a plan of this time 4,200 hectares in Suzhou, uh, which is 42 square kilometers of urban development. Again, we were given six weeks to come up with our proposal. And the complication of this project was that also the overlap uh, that was already there with the existing, but also there were six master plans made before us that all failed. So we also had to kind of make an analysis of what had already failed and make a new proposal in the same six weeks. There we choose to not really come up with an urban plan, but more an urban strategy uh, that had different layers from infrastructure to special uh, zones, but also to where the residential area should be uh, dense and where they should be relaxed, but also how you could deal with nature and with the water on the site uh, that was present uh, to simulate a development uh, that was not uh, dedicated and precise uh, to the square meter of which segment, but more to create a framework in which different developers could really build uh, in later stages of the project. And this was an image that we presented. You see no real architecture present, um, but more a zoning and a strategy. Um, the third and even the fourth and fifth tier cities are already coming up uh, in the same speed. And also there we are participating. We just finished the plan in Changchung, uh, again 16 square kilometers, uh, in a very interesting area in the north uh, east of China, which is very closely related to the north of Korea and to uh, the Soviet Union uh, or Russia. And what is very interesting uh, here is that um, this is still a very communistic area uh, surrounding, and it, what is produced in Changchun is all exported to these regions. So it is actually not very well related to what is happening in the West or in the rest of China, south of China, where the relationships with uh, the West or Africa uh, become more and more important. Um, and we thought it was very important to come up with a master plan that was context specific. And that was not just the next master plan for the next city that is a repetitive uh, strategy. So we, what we looked at was uh, what is Changchun famous for? It's famous for its green. It's a very green city. It is also famous for its production and industry, but also for its creative industries. Uh, all the high-speed trains in China are, for example, planned there. But also all new uh, cars in China are developed in Changchun. Uh, they are designed there. Their design school is uh, comparable to the design school in Stuttgart or Eindhoven, uh, for example. Cities that are also not kind of the main cities of their countries, but creative, uh, really important in the world. So we propose to really make a creative center in this uh, urban development. And we created five different pockets uh, inside the plan of 16 square kilometers on which we could attach uh, different uh, types of program. Uh, sports was one of them. And by doing so, we wanted to create a zone in the center uh, that could kind of hold everything together, such a huge master plan that would be planned in, in about three years' time or built in, in about three years' time. So this is more urban strategy and speed in urban strategy, but also dimension in urban strategy. But if you apply it to building, uh, you see actually a quite similar phenomenon. Uh, this is a, a famous one that you probably all know about, uh, World Trade Center and CCTV. Um, World Trade Center, of course, after 9-11, um, it needed to be replanned. Uh, it was, of course, a very sensitive project. And at the same time, CCTV also came up with kind of a, a thought of a new headquarters in Beijing, uh, also a very sensitive uh, project. 
OMA was invited to participate in both competitions, um, but at that time OMA wasn't big enough to do both, uh, so they had to choose, and they choose for uh, the Chinese uh, competition. Um, if you look at uh, the planning in, uh, for uh, uh, the World Trade Center area, in 2003 a plan was selected with Freedom Tower 1 uh, by Daniel Liebeskind. And um, if you look currently to the site in 2011, uh, the monument is realized, but they are still uh, kind of on their way uh, with the Freedom Tower. At that same time, in 2002, uh, OMA presented uh, the CCTV headquarters, the loop. Um, it was based on the programming of the TV station, which is a constant loop, but it was also a criticism towards skyscrapers that became higher and higher. Um, but when you go higher, the only thing you do is go up and down again. There's no continuity. And um, what OMA wanted to achieve by this uh, building is that also a skyscraper could be continuous and therefore it would also always be the highest one because it would never stop. Um, if you currently look uh, in the city, uh, this is the situation. Uh, it's almost finished. Uh, we will open it in, uh, uh, with Chinese New Year uh, next year. And here you see how the program of this uh, plan was made. You see, really see the continuous loop of making TV with the pre-production, uh, the production spaces, uh, the management, the studios, and the post-production, and the broadcasting. So it was a continuous loop of the program inside of the building. Um, I will show you a few of the uh, current pictures, also some of the interiors uh, that we are currently uh, realizing. When we won the competition, we didn't have immediately the commission for all the interiors, uh, but currently we are finalizing uh, most of them. This is a, a view of the loop, and um, I wanted to point out that in this loop there's also a public route, uh, so for the first time everybody that wants uh, can go to CCTV, see the whole process of TV making, even in China, and then move uh, through the building at the same time. And you see the three windows at the point where uh, the public loop comes to a climax. And that is this space where you see all the structure of the uh, building, but where you see these windows that give you a view to the city, and you can simply walk over them if you dare to. Uh, it's not easy, I can tell you. I'm there, I'm there every week, and um, it's still not uh, easy for me. Um, but also uh, interior spaces uh, for uh, the production uh, always combined uh, with the architecture, so the language of the building is really how it is constructed, but also how uh, you can understand it. And then uh, also open spaces uh, at the end of the public loop where you can overlook uh, Beijing, uh, but also have your own refreshments. Uh, another example in building uh, out of our own practice is uh, two office buildings. One in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, where our headquarters is. A project that we started in 1997, uh, and we won the competition for it. It's the biggest op office building in the Netherlands, still. It's called the Rotterdam, uh, like the city, and it's currently under construction. Um, and a project in Shenzhen, uh, which uh, we are doing from the Hong Kong office, uh, which I'm leading, and that is, uh, this is a building that is about four times the size. And we started the competition in 2006, and we're currently uh, almost uh, ready uh, with the building. And here you see the Rotterdam uh, competition entry in 1997, and here you see in 2011 uh, the result um, this is a private development, and I say that uh, uh, very specifically because you see currently in the US and also in Europe that private development uh, becomes more and more bureaucratic, more and more uh, process-dominated process instead of architecturally uh, dominated or uh, dominated by progress. And that has to do with all the rules, it has to do with all the participation, I will come back to that later. 
Um, this is the competition entry for the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, which was 2006, uh, so about 10 years later uh, than the Rotterdam entry. And this is a picture of two weeks ago. Uh, the building is fully up, uh, the facade is almost on it, and the top floors are already fitted out, because also in China, as soon there is a facade and it is watertight where it is, they start building uh, the interiors. Uh, which is quite fascinating because that means that you have four or five uh, proce building processes at the same time on your site. Um, we have five people constantly on this site to control the quality because speed uh, and quality uh, are also very much uh, related. Um, if you have a lot of time, it's easy to control quality. If there is an enormous speed, uh, you of course need to pay a lot of attention to what the outcome of the building is. And that's also why Omei strongly believes that building can only happen there where you are and there where your people are. Um, the concept, concept of the Shenzhen Stock Exchange was actually quite simple and it also had to be simple because we were asked to participate in the competition five days before the deadline of the competition as a replacement of another party. Uh, the other party said, we are not going to submit. Uh, so the client came to us, can you submit? But by the way, we can't postpone uh, the deadline. So uh, I, I was not at OMA yet. This is uh, told to me by Rem and Shohei, who, who worked on this project at that time. So we had to build a tower and we had to build a podium where uh, all the um, uh, dealing rooms and all the stock exchange activities should be. They lifted up. Uh, that podium 40 meters up in the air, cantilevers of more than 60 meters, and then uh, put some structure on it uh, to be able to create lobbies and entrances, but also to create urban squares in the heart of the CBD. Um, if you only build towers with podiums, everything is very defensive. You can never come close to where it happens. If you create urban squares close to where it happened, you create a center of the CBD, and this building also really functions as the center of the Shenzhen CBD. Here you see a picture of uh, two weeks ago of the underside of this building. Uh, this is the cantilever on the, uh, the thin side, and you, you see now the dramatic uh, approach of this building, because it was always uh, studs underneath it. Nobody really realized what kind of the effect was. And now everything is taken away. Uh, we get a lot of uh, press publicity uh, on it. Um, this is the lobby where sky elevators uh, or scenic elevators go to the roof, the roof of the podium, where there will be a public park. So people can also enter the building and come to the roof uh, even when they don't work at the stock exchange or they don't uh, go to an event there. And here you see that lobby uh, where the sky elevators or the scenic elevators will be uh, in the future. Here you see an image of the uh, main heart of the stock exchange uh, that is still under construction. Um, this is where the new listings will take place with a backdrop uh, to, uh, to the city. And here another image of that. Also on a micro level, we have to deal uh, with speed in architecture. Um, this is uh, the market watching department of the Shenzhen, Shenzhen Stock Exchange, actually the heart. This is where everything happens. This is where somebody shouts, I want to buy that. Uh, and he pushes it on the computer and he uh, buys uh, the shares or he sells it. The problem of a lot of these departments is that people have eight or six screens in front of them and therefore only see what is on the screens and have no communication with the, their colleagues or with their supervisors. Um, but sometimes a tenth of a second uh, makes a difference of millions. Uh, so again, speed here is very important. What can an architect do in this case? So we developed with the Shenzhen Stock Exchange a full new desk. Um, it looks very simple. Um, and actually it is very simple. It is a Z-shape or a V-shape desk uh, where uh, people can look at uh, the eight screens they need at the same time, but also can look at their colleagues, can look at the central uh, indication, but also at the supervisors that are in front of them. Um, so this tenth of a second communication can take place much clearer. Uh, many stock exchanges around the world are interested in this desk now. 
Another uh, uh, thing in China, phenomenon uh, speed, is uh, this is on our building site, uh, a speed marriage uh, of a lot of people. Um, it's uh, about two days ago. Uh, it's taken by Michael Kokora, the project architect of this building. And the funny thing about it is that or the male or the female of the couples are all working for the contractor of the building and were offered a free uh, wedding uh, inside the uh, conference center of this uh, building uh, that is already uh, finished. So quite funny in my position. So again, an image of it. As I said, it is very important to realize that this is both private developments and therefore one uh, is in a, pr a procedure that takes much longer in the Western world and one is uh, in a Chinese world where when if one leader says yes, uh, it, it, it can simply happen. In the public sector, uh, you still see that uh, developments are quite aligned in time, um, but you already start seeing that also there in the West, the investment on public buildings and public construction goes down, and in the East, that actually goes up rapidly, cultural buildings come more and more, and uh, therefore a comparison between our Casa de Musica in Porto and our Tepe Performing Arts Center, where David is my reviewer for the project. He asked the difficult questions uh, for me. That's why I think it's very interesting tonight that he also gives his own perspective on speed in architecture. So Casa de Musica, uh, it's already finished. It was finished in 2006. It was the first concert hall that really has a window to the city. So daylight simply comes in when there's a concert during day. During night, uh, you see all the lights from the city and people can still look into the performance. Um, we had a challenge in Taipei that was totally different, but also quite similar because it had to deal with the city, how to incorporate the city in culture. And we were given a site, uh, the most famous night market of Taipei, a very vibrant place. Um, and then they asked us to take that all away and replace it by theater, a formal form of uh, culture, which we thought was kind of unbelievable difficult because what is already there is maybe most of the time nicer than what you had to plan, um, especially if you see the intensity of that place and, and the intensity of how people use it. And in the Asian uh, world, as many of you probably know, the night markets are the places where things happen. Uh, after work. Um, so what we did, we proposed to keep the night market and not erase it um, and to simply have a building that hovers above it uh, so that we could use the city culture and uh, the more formal or high-end culture as, as the mayor called it uh, could be combined and could kind of start communicating. And we thought that this was only possible in Taipei because there is a real important phenomenon in Taipei, namely everybody goes to theater uh, theater shows are sold out uh, a, a long time before, but it also happens that people with a tuxedo sit next to people with jeans. Um, and that is a very interesting thing. It's for all ages, it's for all uh, walks of life, and people really enjoy it. And it has to do with the fact that um, in Taipei, currently in Asia, the best theater is produced and, and made. The best theater makers are there. Um, they have the possibility to speak freely, um, but they still have the Chinese background, they have the Japanese background, and they also have the connection uh, to the US, which David will also point out later on. Uh, so this was the model that we envisioned, uh, the um, uh, theaters above uh, the night market, uh, attracting the same people as uh, attracted by the night market. This is a pan that we found in the night mar market, um, <laughs> One dish uh, cooked in one pan, three different ingredients, elements of it, brought together uh, when you start uh, eating. And we thought that that was also an interesting giving for the theater. Maybe we could turn all the back of houses of the theaters together, and by doing so, create new possibilities of connection of space. Um, as I said, we are space planners, so maybe we should find new ways of also a cultural space. Most exciting cultural events don't happen in formal theaters, but happen in a park or happen in a factory uh, or a place that is not kind of specially designed uh, for the cultural event. 
And we thought by doing this, maybe we could combine again this formal way of opera or, or theater with kind of more informal uh, new ways of theater by combining spaces. Uh, so this is the, uh, the proposal that we had uh, to have the three theaters separately and perfectly for their use. Grand Theater for Opera and, and Drama, a Proscenium Playhouse for Dance, and a Multiform Theater for more experimental theater. But uh, you could also combine them and kind of take the stage walls uh, out and then have spaces of 100 meter in length, 40 meters in width, where people from three sides can look into it and different forms of theater uh, could take place. And this is the model that is also in the exhibition uh, below. Uh, that we presented, and that is a, a, a treasure. Uh, I made it myself, and I, I really <laughs> want it back, so don't touch it. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, this is the, uh, the Grand Theatre, uh, uh, a theatre that we uh, made uh, out of one plane. Um, we didn't want to create a balcony with separation, but we started with one plane and then started folding the plane, so you could all, always come from all sides to all the seats in the theater. It's a, a, a theater of about uh, 3,000 seats. And then uh, you see uh, here the multiform theater, which is a more flexible theater. It, it is, has a flat floor. You can build up uh, um, all kinds of uh, ways of tribunes, but also central stage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but if you combine them, uh, you get this length. Uh, so simply raise the stage doors at the back, uh, that are fire rated, but also acoustically uh, feasible for um, uh, both uh, using separately. But if you take them away and just lift them up in the air, you can use the whole uh, plane and people can look from two sides into them, which uh, could create uh, this. Uh, plays that are totally different orchestrated and uh, could only take place in this theater. We're working with the theater makers of Taipei, uh, people like Stan Lai and Youth Theater, to really develop uh, this plan uh, also to their needs, uh, which is a very interesting uh, collaboration uh, with non-architects, with people that think totally different about the use of a building and uh, totally different to the use of, uh, of technique. Um, I must say I learn uh, a lot from that. And then the Proscenium Playhouse, which is really a circular uh, theater. Uh, you probably all know, acoustically not very uh, smart. Um, so that's why we punched a lot of holes in them, which are the boxes uh, where people can sit separately. And there all the acoustical value of the uh, space is arranged and therefore there's no reflection like what you would have normally in a circular space. Uh, also, the proscenium uh, of it is circular, so you will look at a circular opening where things, things happen. Another ingredient of this uh, design was, but you have the people going to the night market, they don't all have a ticket, um, so how can you can make them also like the building? So there's a public route through the building that you can enter for free, and you can see all the ingredients, you can go through the grid, you can even uh, go to the... Uh, one of the to the proscenium playhouse and look at the play. You will not hear anything because you're behind acoustical walls, but you will see it. So an escalator going through the main lobby, uh, a route that goes behind the scenes so you can look to the uh, to the stage, but also look to the backstage and see the actors prepare. And then in the end, also through the proscenium playhouse, see the play, uh, but don't hear it. So. Uh, more a machine for theater, a machine on top of a night market than a beautiful architectural building. Um, I got a lot of critic uh, uh, on, on the outlook of this building, how it looks. Um, it's not pretty. They call it in uh, Taipei uh, tofu and a 1,000 year old egg, um, which is something as an architect you have to deal with. But actually, I'm quite proud that they say that, because that means that we don't make an architectural statement, but that we make a machine that people believe in uh, and actually going to use. Because nobody uh, erased the building, although it's uh, very ugly. Uh, not in my view, but in the view of many people. So now, how is this decision-making uh, influenced? Uh, if you look at the strategy of China, uh, how they have organized their decision-making process, actually we see a system that we are very familiar with in the West. Uh, you have the government uh, with a few decision-makers, you, you have the provincial level, and you have the uh, municipality level. 
And uh, they all have decision makers, and it's very clear who they are. This is an example for Shenzhen. Uh, so you know exactly to talk to who, uh, and it's very interesting. And they can make the decision. Yeah? They can simply make the decision, and often they are advised by the lower level, and then they will proceed. Um, and why do they uh, proceed? Um, that is interesting. Uh, if you then look at, for example, the UK, it is not really different. Uh, there, again, you have uh, the national level, you have the regional level and the local level. And this decision-making process is actually as simple as that. But there's one big difference, and that's the yellow bar, and that's the public level. Uh, the public uh, has influence on this decision-making process. Uh, again, uh, the people are pretty clear. Um, we did research in the last few days on London, so we didn't find all the faces but uh, we found the numbers. Uh, so it's pretty clear who. Uh, and they also take decisions based often on the advice of the people below them. But there's this one big difference. They also have to kind of think about what the public wants, and they have to listen to that voice, because else they will never come back. Then they become a black person after four years or three years when there is a re-election. Um, that bureaucracy uh, really changes the decision-making process drastically uh, on the private level, but also on the public level. So you can say uh, that public influence uh, is very good. You should really listen to what the people want uh, from a Western perspective. Uh, but it is also a big problem uh, at this moment of time because it's connected to the decision-makers. And you will be more careful to make a decision to try something or to go for something when it could be uh, your last uh, decision uh, you can make. Um, if you want to explain the US, it's going to be extremely difficult because every state, 50 states, have their own system, 50 systems. And I didn't want to bother you with explaining that. Um, I think it's quite boring, but I also simply don't know. Um, so you, you, you really can't uh, predict what the, how in the US decision making is done, especially not an architect, not from the state. It's almost impossible to really politically influence. That said, I also have a personal experience in Europe uh, where uh, a significant uh, moment uh, influenced this decision making process. Uh, the public engagement was still uh, very important. But there was a disaster in the Netherlands. Uh, not many of you uh, know it, probably. But in 2000, there was a firework factory in Enschede, a city in the east of the Netherlands, that exploded. And it damaged uh, one third of the city. Um, it was our only moment as the Netherlands live on CNN uh, with people uh, running. And this was the result, which obviously was devastating. Um, a lot of you might know the city because Grolsbier or Grolsbier uh, is coming from the city. It's world famous. Uh, and that's the factory of, of the beer. Uh, uh, um, and it didn't explode, luckily, because else the whole city was gone, because there is a lot of uh, material that would burn and also give a reaction. Um, one more comment. Uh, every year in China, two firework factories blow up. I never saw that on CNN Live. Uh, maybe you saw it. Uh, but uh, this is a disaster that was significant for the Netherlands because we were given the opportunity to make a master plan uh, with public engagement with, with no other procedures. Uh, we could decide immediately directly with the people in charge at the government what to do. And that master plan was finished and approved in 2002 for a rebuilding of one third of a city in about one and a half years with public engagement. And if you then even go further, you look at the center of that part, which has a cultural center, an educational center, and a commercial center. Even three years later, these buildings were finished. Again, with public engagement, everybody that lived in this area had the right to return. Everybody that lived in this area before the disaster had the right to speak up what they wanted for the area. But still, in three years, we were able to develop significant buildings uh, that connect the old, as you see, parts that were still there uh, with new architecture. 
This is a building I made with Search, my former <laughs> office, um, when I was uh, not working at Ome yet. So the queen even came to open it, uh, so she was also happy with the speed. Finally, something happened in the country. And then uh, these are images of the product that that can deliver. In my point of view, still a very high quality architectural project, uh, um, not bothered by decision making processes that are, take extremely long uh, and that deliver a nice uh, end result. So why um, don't we do that more often, you could say. This is the internal street uh, of the project. This is the inside of that tunnel you just saw crossing. Uh, this is the tower where we, for the first time, used uh, kind of the print on top of the uh, ceilings that uh, are fire rated uh, and uh, get the smoke through. And that gives this result uh, at night. And the same technique is used in the bank building here in London uh, that OMA is made in the, in the walls. So you will see on this box later on when the lights are on in the evening, you see prints uh, of uh, all kinds of different. So if we look at this perspective and we think that maybe this double dip is a disaster, uh, would, be a, would we be able to change in the West and maybe also our speed? This is a very positive remark. This is not scientific. Uh, I have no proof that it will work, but I, I think I should just mention it because also if you look at the Chinese uh, way of looking at a disaster, a disaster is combined of two characters, one meaning dangerous and or danger, and one uh, meaning change or opportunity. Uh, if you look at uh, a disaster like that, uh, maybe it could be also a turning point uh, of uh, what we are doing. And then we might be able to do the same thing as uh, China. Again, I have no proof whatsoever. It's just a, a kind of statement. Uh, that I think we should start thinking uh, of our economy currently in the, in the matter of the word uh, change instead of uh, trying to find more bureaucratic ways of dealing with it. Um, this is what I uh, was going to say. I invite David now to give his perspective uh, from a Taiwanese uh, point of view. Thank you, David. Um, when I first were asked by David to uh, talk about speed of architecture, I thought it's extremely difficult um, because as an architect, we deal with more about space rather than uh, uh, speed. In any cases, I uh, realized that when, rather than just thinking about a building, maybe when we talk about the cities and its phenomena um, in, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in Asia, might be able to answer the question. So I thought it's not really inappropriate or irrelevant to talk about a war city in Taipei, and which would be my first part of the talk. And my second part would be an analogy of uh, what an architect can do in that part of the world. So here we go. We all started with the formula because we ask ourselves what is speed. And it all has to do with the uh, denominator divided by nominator, which is space divided by time. And it's a bit different uh, situation from China when we talk about Taiwan. Um, if, to, if you think about the second um, formula, in China, most of people know that they have huge amount of uh, a built area, as uh, David uh, demonstrated. In Taiwan and Hong Kong, and certainly Tokyo, that we have only limited space. But then the turnover rate of these space, of the surface of the land, is so fast that uh, it creates a different kind of phenomenon. So I want to start with this uh, image, which is uh, uh, in Taipei, uh, Ximendin, the, the uh, East Gate area, um, as we call it. If you look carefully of the image, um, all these um, billboards up there, it all has to do with speed. 
If you go from Nike, it helps you run faster. And then on top of that, it's uh, the uh, Yamaha uh, mopeds, scooters, and then also the device to get you connected uh, to a very uh, far away place. It all has to do with uh, speed. And then if you look at the second uh, image, which is, was taken uh, not too uh, long after the, that first uh, image, you will see, still see uh, Nike. And, but also something has changed. The Nokia smartphone came out. And that's how fast with these uh, electronic gadgets. Um, every nine months, it's replaced. It's impossible to get the, uh, the, the, the previous model that you got. And also, um, this image says something about the uh, uh, sedentary uh, speed. Now we all sit home, use our smartphone or iPad, or we sit just like them, and we just wanted to have faster connections. So we, it also gives us a different ideas of what speed is about. So with that, I am uh, going to bring in this uh, story it's of Taipei. This is uh, the... Uh, Google map, which I uh, had a print screen uh, image uh, just two days ago. This is the current Taipei, where you can see the uh, president's palace, or it used to be the governor, governor's uh, palace in Japanese time, Chiang Kai-shek Mem Memorial. And you can sort of vaguely make out the, uh, the city wall, which is like this. This is the very first um, city planning map of Taiwan, if you will. It was drawn up by Japanese in 1904. You can see that over there. When they came to Taiwan, occupied it uh, nine years. They came in 1895. And uh, at that time, they really want to wipe out what Qing Dynasty had over there in Taipei. And in order to do that, they uh, took out the wall, they took out a city gate, the west gate, and also planned an expo to happen on the, uh, on the uh, <coughs> top of the city wall that they took out. And this was what was uh, planned at that time. So the uh, west gate of Taipei was gone. It replaced by this building in uh, 1935, 40 years after the, uh, they, they came to Taiwan and celebrating their um, fifth island, as they call it at that time. This is also an image of, uh, of that First, very first ever expo in Taiwan. So with that expo, they took out the wall, they planned the expo. After the expo, the, uh, the, the, uh, the city wall, which was uh, a Qing dynasty, became the widest row in, uh, in Taiwan, a total tabula rasa. So it became something like this. Not only that, at the very beginning, they also uh, planned to have a railroad, a railroad uh, connecting to the south part of the island. What happened was in 1945, the American came, bombed the city, and, uh, a, uh, and, and put an end to, to the war. Four years later, because of the Great Retreat, as you might know, General Chiang Kai-shek lead a bunch of what we call, at that time, the mainlander, or the lay immigrants, to Taiwan. And uh, since there's so many of them, they have no place to stay. So they built squatters on top of the, the widest road in Taiwan, and uh, they, in order to make a living, they create shops, restaurants, and uh, brings out their home flavor to uh, Taipei. 
and this was what got built there. So pretty soon, the uh, Chiang Kai-shek saw this. He's not very happy about it, and especially at that time, uh, General Eisenhower was uh, supposed to come. So he built this modernist building and decided to put them inside this, uh, these buildings. So from this, the squatters with all kinds of shops and, uh, and, and, and vendors, food vendors, it became something like this. So it's, at that time, considered a certain kind of progress and also the uh, modernist style uh, language of uh, architecture came into uh, Taiwan. So there you have it. On top of what once was a city wall and then was an expo, became these, uh, these shops for modern Taipei. And that's where, as a youngster, we went. We went there for food, we went there for the, um, the uh, Western rock and roll uh, music uh, records, the LP. At the same time, you, you can tell that the, at this part of the city, also the Americans built the, their information uh, services, part of the CIA. And what they do is they ha exercise their influence. This image, you can tell that it's in uh, during the American elections, and all these people there are watching live broadcasting um, of the vote. Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, got five votes up there, uh, the five delegates vote for that time. So the, the American influence at the same time um, stays in Taiwan, but the same time at the other part of uh, China or across the strait, there's cultural revolution going on. So in order to uh, differentiate what's happening over there, uh, General Chiang Kai-shek used these, the North Gate, which was still there, to advocate what he believed to be the real traditional Chineseness in this island. And that Chinese island, uh, that, I'm sorry, and, and that Chineseness became something else when it mingled with the American influence there because of the North Korea War and the Vietnam War. So as you can tell, this image was taken around 1976, where you can see John Travolta doing his, uh, his disco, his uh, Saturday Night Fever over there. And indeed, these are the places where we get our um, Western influence or American influence gets the uh, Coca-Cola and what have you. It also, signi uh, it also signified a, uh, an era coming to an end. Um, General Chiang Kai-shek passed away pretty much around the same time, and the building got torn down to make way for new um, city development, which is the underground uh, railroad and uh, the uh, transit. 40 years after they uh, moved to Taiwan, they realized finally, that they're not going back to mainland, and they have to make do of well, what's there. So this became um, what it was, or what it is now, the uh, a very wide uh, boulevard. So we entered the next stage, um, which is uh, trying to plant trees. Now that we have public transit, it's easier to move around. And uh, also uh, the uh, pedestrian area, which a lot of youngsters go. No more um, the, uh, the, the, no more the, the pirate um, records, but we still are developing these uh, juvenile youngster culture in this part of the uh, city. And uh, guns are this, but uh, different things stay, you can tell that that's BGs. Grand Funk Railroad, but people like my age would know what there it's about. Um, so the American influence uh, somehow stay, even though those buildings are gone. And um, just a little note here. Um, 
for 30 years because of what we call maybe bamboo curtain at one point, but certainly because of cultural revolution, um, uh, what Taiwan developed in the past 60 years, China from 49 to 79, uh, till the end of Gang of Four, they picked up again by uh, Deng Xiaoping and then uh, trying to catch up with, uh, with the West. So uh, it, when we talk about speed, they only have half of the time to catch up what's there. And in a sense, that's why it, it moves so fast from my point of view. But let's take a look at, at, at what happened there. This was the uh, Expo, it says Taiwan Expo, and this is the, again the 1935 um, Expo that was there. And, uh, and, and, and during that time, around, around the same time, in uh, MoMA, New York City, uh, Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson is uh, doing this show, as we all know, Exhibition 15, The International Style. What people in Taiwan Pavilion knows is that maybe more important than a building or a style is something behind that. So I found this image and I decided that I just have to show it to you in the sense that people at that time, the non-architects, know that the resources and other things, economy, politics, are more important and, and with that, they, that's their uh, vision <coughs> to the future. This is uh, what they had in that building about Chinese tea, or rather Taiwanese tea. It goes to England, that's the reason, one of the reasons I want to put it up there. Also, second from your left is uh, Indonesia at that time, a Dutch uh, 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 place, and a Dutch territory, and uh, also U.S. on the very left, and Mandarin China on the very right. So in this uh, image, what they're trying to say is the influence through tea and through the econ e economical power it could reach uh, out. So you can tell the people up there is running on top of the, uh, the globe. And you can also tell what Japanese are thinking at that time. Taiwan is much, much bigger than what it is. And also is Korea. With Taiwan, Korea, and Japan, and Taiwan was considered at that time their fifth island, they are going to make a, a big country and it's so much closer to each other and they're going to reach out to the world. And again, that's 1935. But the point is, um, maybe it's not just in terms of a style of a building. There's something behind this when you wanted to, to make things happen. And uh, of those things, one of these are the, uh, the, the, uh, the food vendors also demonstrate the kind of uh, richness of, uh, of what's there. And, and again, I am going to take you all to the night market uh, where uh, Oma and David Jonathan is doing uh, Taipei Performing Arts Center, or TPAC, as we called it. And this is an image of how people lined up in front of these food vendors, which, uh, again, that's where we all go uh, at the end of the world, work to have some food and to meet friends. And these people are just lining up so there are some formal buildings and there are some temporary buildings. And again, you have seen this. This is the, uh, certainly the, uh, the, the pots that uh, David mentioned. With these, it shows the kind of rawness and the combination of the, uh, of the food, the hot pots where they cook the, uh, the meat. And also at the same time, it has spicy and non-spicy all together. And this is where, um, in a sense, the OMA project uh, impressed the, uh, the jurors. Uh, and they've explained how the theaters could be combined together in a way also symbolize what's happening there in, in Taiwan. More than just food, 
in the sense that in Taiwan we have all these influences that I'm trying to, 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 to demonstrate through the example of the uh, West Wall um, story. We had Chinese, Japanese, American, and Taiwanese, if you will, and also Aborigines, all in one place. And this is uh, the reason that uh, this building has been very successful. And again, that's the site where uh, the building would be built um, in uh, three years time. So again, let's take a look at the night market where mobility is almost everything. You get a bit of everything in the f vendors and it became a mill. And here's the anal analogy that I want to make, uh, which is mopeds or scooters, if you will. We already have this. Everybody knows that the uh, high-speed rail takes you really fast everywhere. And uh, yet at the same time, all these uh, scooterists, all these uh, bike riders, pretty much all of them has a, uh, a, a car in their house. And yet when they go to work or they go, want to go anywhere, they take out the mopeds because it gets you there fast. Even though the car is much more comfortable, but it gets you there fast. And this is pretty much, in a way, what you know, an architect do in that part of the world, world, in the sense that you have to be able to adopt all kinds of situation and uh, be fast to get there, to go um, to where you want to be. And I'm sure <laughs> that's the work that Oma is now currently doing in Taiwan. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you, David, for again for coming here and to giving your perspective on, on speed. I, th I think it's amazing that you translate speed not by kind of uh, how fast things can go, but how fast things change and how many phases uh, you can get through speed. Um, you give an example in, in Taiwan. Um, what is your own experience with speed in China? Because I talked a lot about, uh, about China, uh, because there is where many of our projects take place. Uh, what is your experience uh, with China and your view to speed there? Well, first of all, I, I think I should mention a little bit about that Taiwan example that mm -hmm. I get. Um, I call it a uh, Tales of Seven Cities because in the uh, West Wall area. In the past 105 years, I counted it and it at least goes through seven uh, phases. So that's 15 years of if you divide it. So, mm -hmm. so it, it changed uh, incredibly fast. Now when it comes to China, it's even faster. I first went to uh, Shanghai mm -hmm. in the late 80s and uh, and then again the early 90s uh, 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 which time that everybody described Shanghai as a big construction site mm -hmm. and uh, they were still in the early 90s they were still building brick high-rise as you remember and it again of course it all changed and it changed so fast that the uh, that, you know, it's hard to imagine at other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's my first take of that. And also um, the uh, populations, you know, that's something they have to face um, very quickly because uh, as you show, a lot of people from the countryside moved to the first tier and second tier country, with, you know, incredible amount of people. So it's just happened so fast. So, so your observation, um, because you were there, and many of us were not there when there was the Cultural Revolution and could not easily access the first phases of the development, is quite similar with the observations we have now and, and the acceleration we, we see now. Oh yeah. Okay. oh, yeah. But what's your observation, I want to tell you, because you've been to uh, all parts of uh, Chinese-speaking mm -hmm. world. In, in that area, 
And again, I, I have a feeling that it's quite different. Uh, just talking about you know different parts of China, different uh, regions, but also with the Hong Kong, Taiwan. Well, what's your yeah. observation? Um, I, I think for for us, it's um, I, I talked a lot about Chinese and Chinese projects. Compare them with Europe and, and the U.S. Uh, but we are uh, working from our Hong Kong office, but also from the Be Beijing office in, in most of the Asian countries by now and having projects uh, all over Asia. And we see similar phenomenon everywhere, uh, namely that the speed goes so fast uh, that uh, there's a certain gentrification uh, that is not, not related to kind of the country anymore or the culture of the country. Um, but because of speed, uh, context is erased, uh, history is erased. And, and how do you deal with that? Because I can also understand it. When you go so fast, you don't have kind of the possibilities to, to root your design, and root right. your design in, in that history. But there is a, there is a <coughs> difference between what is happening in China and mainly in the eastern part of China versus the western part or the rest of, of, of Asia, uh, where you see that uh, after these first fast developments, people start to see that it actually doesn't really work because it doesn't cater for their uh, beliefs, it doesn't cater for their way of life. And uh, you see now in Shanghai, for example, in Pudong, uh, that areas are already kind of deserted again right. Uh, right. after five, six years after they were built and people start moving again back to the old concessions and, and try to develop these in a way that is more rooted in their culture. You see that also, for example, in Malaysia and in Indonesia, where it's a very interesting combination between being Asian but also being Islamic, which are two topics that are discussed in the world currently uh, that are very significant, but there they are combined. It's a huge force mm -hmm. of people that are now starting to develop their cities and starting to develop their, their areas around them in a way that is uh, even almost faster than what happened in China 15 years ago. But they are really trying to kind of take the context and their own culture in consideration. So from my perspective now being uh, for OMA in Asia two and a half years, <coughs> uh, I see many differences already in this short period of time uh, over different countries, different regions of China, but also countries elsewhere in, in Asia, which I think is also uh, very difficult uh, to grasp if you are simply not there, if you're not constantly traveling there and constantly engaging in it, because in two, three months it could change. Right. And then it's also very difficult as right. a Western architect uh, from a distance to make uh, kind of a good design, because you're not there, you're not witnessing the development. But it is also something that changes in such a flexible and unpredictable way uh, that if it, you really need to engage with it, which is also uh, very hard uh, to do as a Westerner because many of the considerations you simply don't understand. Yeah. And that is why our team, for example, in Hong Kong uh, is made out of uh, 16 nationalities, but 60% of them are Asians um, because we really need the blood uh, of, of what is happening uh, uh, everywhere and in every country. So from every uh, greater Chinese nation, if I don't offend you with saying that Taiwan is part of, of, of greater China, but also the other uh, countries like Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, right. Indonesia, you need kind of this combination of flavors to be able to really respond, Absolutely. which is a challenge uh, for me being Western, Western face and, and heading the office. but. It, it, it is a very interesting development. And I also think that many more Asian faces soon will take over what we are trying to do. Um, because in the end, um, we are foreigners and yeah. not understand everything. Yeah, but I also would say you are very Asian. <laughs> in the sense that when you talk about the exchange building, how fast you have to respond and all the team work together. Mm. Um, in the sense that I'm going to bring up something that uh, you certainly have personal experience. That is, we talk about uh, when you talk about Cheng uh, mm -hmm. in Mandarin, which is uh, city design or urban design or urban planning in 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 China, which is a totally different animal 
from what I was taught mm -hmm. at this school called the Graduate School of Design. It's, it has very different concept in the sense that usually when as an architect we talk about speed, we, we take it as a more of a negative mm -hmm. kind of a thing in the sense that we, because more, we, most of us deal with space rather than uh, time. Mm -hmm. But um, when you do Changshu Shiji, or again, urban uh, design, city design, urban planning in China, I have a sense they try to bring up all these different disciplines, if you will, uh, together. Uh, uh, in the sense that when I was in the uh, design school, the uh, urban planning department was in uh, school of government rather than the design school. Yeah. And what happened is that the designer has no idea what policy making and, <laughs> and governance of people means. While on the other hand, those people would have a hard time understanding the practitioner, the practice of that. In China, somehow, I felt that it's all combined together, uh, landscaper, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure. I would even go further. I think the, the physical part of it is just a minor part of the planning. It's a, you're, you're doing social planning, cultural planning, historical planning at the, same time. Uh, at the same time, which indeed I was also not taught in my Western education when I had urban planning. At university, we were. It was a physical process, and of course, infrastructure and landscape were part of it. But culture and and social uh, behavior and observation of that, but also new social behavior, because simply these people come from everywhere uh, and are not there yet. So you cannot not observe it before you plan it. Right. You're planning. You're planning something for something you only can predict uh, that that happens which is a, uh, a, a nice challenge. And what, what I think is really important in that typology of planning is that you make it, although you go extremely fast, and although the building will go extremely fast after you plant it, by many architects, most of them Chinese, that you will never be able to communicate with uh, as an urban planner. Uh, no, but, but that's, that's the case because it goes so fast. If you want to kind of control 42 square kilometers in a way we as Westerners think as a supervisor or it's totally impossible uh, and and what is really important is that you need to frame kind of the important social cultural and physical uh, parts of a city uh, part of the urban life and then in between leave it completely open and flexible for interpretation of others uh, in that framework to fill it out uh, or fill it in, yeah. you could maybe also say. Yeah. So it, it is a very interesting um, dilemma we have. Although mm. we are taught to be physical planners, we should actually plan uh, frameworks instead of the physical uh, part of it. Right, mm. absolutely. Mm. Okay. Well, should, we, should we involve you? Because maybe <laughs> we are getting boring, no? <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, and thank you very much, first of all, for both of you. It was fascinating. Um, you were talking about prices you pay uh, working uh, with uh, 42, or, sorry, you said a lot of Chinese architects mm. to plan 42 square kilometers. And I wondered, what are the prices that you pay in quality once you go fast, if you pay anything? in quality, um, taking into account that the Western world is now going slow against <laughs> fast food and going back to nature. Yeah. The second question is, um, is the future really cities? Just cities? Mm. Uh, let me answer the f second question first. If you hear my lecture carefully, you already heard me speak that the city is nothing without its surroundings. And, and therefore, I think countryside and, and villages are very significant. And the development of that uh, might be slower, but uh, need to be incorporated in our thinking, which at the current moment, it is definitely not yet. Um, you see some interesting models now about urban planning and planning of the surroundings 
in countries we can't talk about anymore, like Syria. And, and there was some very interesting developments in Libya before uh, Gaddafi was uh, kind of challenged, uh, where the first plannings were there, where uh, not only the urban development was considered, but also the surrounding was uh, carefully planned. Uh, and the funny thing it was by, by most of the time by locals that really thought it was important to overcome this kind of Western signature take over our city uh, syndrome. And it could only happen in countries like that because there was always tension between West and their own, 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 own governments. I think in China, um, people are still too focused on the urban development because uh, so many people go to the city um, uh, that they simply can't keep up. But you see now very interesting developments in, in uh, especially the western part of China, where uh, they are planning uh, energy resources outside of the city um, and planning them in such a way that they always create tension centers. So for example, uh, solar and, and uh, wind combined or uh, solar and water combined. Water is scarce in the west of China. Uh, um, and by planning them together, they create new centers where smaller settlements uh, are left uh, to uh, rise. Uh, so it's also a first kind of thinking about how the countryside could contribute, not only by giving energy to the city, but also by giving new energy to the surroundings itself. Um, so I think, yes, it's very significant to start thinking about countryside and, and, and the village, but it, it, it's still a long way to go. Um, your first question is more difficult to answer because uh, answering it, it in an honest way means stepping on toes. And, and uh, as architects, you need to have a lot of respect for what other planners do, and you need to have a, re a lot of respect for what governments try to achieve. And, uh, but it is true simply that f fast development or speedy development uh, often um, brings less quality result. And, and how can you deal with that? I, I think everybody deals with it in a different way and people choose to be part of it or choose to be not part of it, uh, which is, is a way of dealing with it. Um, my belief and, and also the belief of my team in, in, in Asia, because I'm sitting here, but I represent kind of about uh, 70 young architects uh, that are working in Asia now uh, for uh, kind of OMA. Um, what our belief is that we should be unbelievable part of it. We should live it and we should breathe it, which means we want to control, although we go fast. And it doesn't mean that, w that means that you have to be very flexible in trying to control quality, but always try to find, even when you go fast, a solution that delivers a quality you can live with. And I'm, I see now the end result of, for example, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, uh, where uh, you see different methods applied that what we had in our construction documentations, for example, because of speed, it needed to change but we still worked with the people on site, really sketching even on the walls, working to uh, establish the quality. And that's, that's my belief is you can't do it from a distance, you can't do it without the real engagement in it. And actually, I as a Westerner probably can't do it at all. Uh, I, I, I need the, the tool uh, of the team, I need the tool of the uh, Chinese speaking or the Malay speaking or the Indonesian speaking person uh, that is inventive, that is fast, that dares to take the decision, uh, even when they can't talk to me or can't talk to Rem, just because of quality. And I think that is uh, a very exciting uh, new development in the architectural practice of OMA, is that you, you kind of really spread out that uh, experience, spread out the responsibility in the, in just for the reason of quality. Um, but it's just a philosophy. There are many other philosophies, and um, I believe in this one, and the, the results, hopefully in, in one or two years, uh, will tell you, uh, or hopefully also tell me, if I was right, and, and, and if we were right. But no clue. Thank you. Can I talk a little bit about yes, the first questions? Yeah. Um, a uh, younger colleague of mine 
um, he tends to say, and he told this to students too, he also a, a, a practicing architect, he said, you know, part of the how good you can do the work is how fast you can do the work. Now, I do not necessarily agree 100% with what he said, but certainly doing things good enough at uh, the uh, uh, relatively uh, short amount of time is probably uh, what all of us are facing today. And so I, I suppose that the uh, speed usually, again, means the less uh, quality for, for, for a lot of people. And yet it's something that we all have to deal with. And also in the same sense that all these uh, uh, internet are not fast enough. It's just we're living in this uh, age that we have to respond fast enough. Part of the uh, architecture, if you will, in the Asian part of the world, we, we have a little bit different um, concept. Let, let me put it that way. The, the, the Chinese t term, or Taiwanese term, Chinese, I should say, Mandarin, actually borrowed this concept or the character from Jap Japan. And Japan also didn't have the, con the Western concept of architecture until uh, 19, late 19th century. Um, we have craftsmen rather than a master architect uh, who plans everything on, on the table in his room before going to the site. Um, we have this, uh, uh, the, uh, this story written a long time ago. It's called Zi Ren Zhuan. It's in the, uh, the 10th century when, when this gentleman uh, wrote something, a story, tells a story telling that a, a, an architect, if you will, is just like the prime minister, how one adopt and respond very fast to situation, all kinds of crisis. So in Chinese we say that one has to, again, uh, in Mandarin, 因地制宜, depends on the situation, and respond quickly. And also, 就地取材, make do or make use of what you have. And, and in a way, that's what this uh, story is about, uh, the craftsmen or, or architect, the, the Chinese architects uh, uh, do. So in a sense, I suppose it's very different um, from the Western concept of Bruno Lutsky uh, solving the, uh, the church. So it's just my two cents. Um, hi, uh, thanks to both David for the um, very enlightening talk. Uh, I like that both of you started with the, the formula of uh, distance over time. Um, you could maybe extend the formula to uh, reflect speed as inversely proportional to maybe reflection or thinking. Um, we've been talking all night about speed in architecture, the architecture of speed. Uh, is there space for reflection in architecture, the architectural reflection? Um, any thoughts? Um, yeah, as you know, the philosophy of OMA's practice, reflection on architecture and reflection on, on, on the outcome of what we do is extremely important. Um, it's, always, it's often referred to as research or <coughs> wasting time to make an analysis at the, or what kind of ever you, you, you want to make out of it. Um, of course, that gets under pressure when you have to be fast because to make an analysis and to, to reflect, you also sometimes need to retreat and, and take time to, to, uh, to really think or try to be intelligent. Um, in, in, a, in a way, what we are trying to do is to in, in our Asian practice now is trying to do things parallel and do things with different minds. So people are reflecting and people are designing and people are planning and people are uh, at the same time. And where it comes all together is on the, in the discussion. Um, rather than in planning different variations, we don't plan anything until the discussion happens. And the outcome of that discussion is always just one or two uh, possible outcomes. Um, so it's a, it's a different way of how the practice worked before, where we really 
reflect a long time, then come up with a lot of options, and uh, from these options uh, refer back to the research, refer back to the analysis, and then go a direction. In this case, everything happens parallel, uh, but what is missing is that we give an answer until uh, the discussion took place. So we will not make a sequence, but we, in the end, come up with the right direction, or in our belief, the right direction immediately. So we need to accommodate reflection in a different way, uh, and we need to accommodate it in a very speedy process. Um, I, I like your extension of the, uh, of the formula. Um, may, maybe we should test if, if, if you put reflection in it, the, f the outcome of the formula uh, becomes different. Maybe that is what progress uh, is resembling in, in, in this exhibition. Okay, I think we've probably got time for about two more questions. So. Um, hi, David. Um, uh, there seems to be an implication, uh, especially in, in your uh, lecture, David G, that, um, <laughs> that faster is better. And if that's the case, should China and Asia go even faster? And if they should, how fast is too fast? And um, again, there was a kind of suggestion that Europe should go faster. And, but do you think it's as relevant to go fast in Europe as it is to go fast in Asia? Because in Asia, obviously, there's a huge population growth, so going faster is relevant. But that situation's different um, in Europe. <coughs> so, to which David this was? Okay. Oh. Um, I think it's extremely relevant to talk about speed in, in, in Europe. Um, but there's a very political and maybe philosophical uh, reason behind it uh, that takes a lot of time to explain. But one of the things that I see is that we are stuck uh, in, in Europe, and that's the, the place I know best, um, uh, in such a way that we want to develop and we want to think about uh, uh, what we have and uh, what it could be, uh, and also how we could incorporate our past into our new development and in the progress that we are making uh, with kind of the digital world, with the way we are working, it, it becomes different. So our buildings need to adapt, our cities need to adapt to that, infrastructure need to adapt to that. But we are not capable of making the right decisions at the right moments. And because we are delaying the decision, we're delaying the progress. And that becomes a kind of a circle that constantly uh, makes things not happen while we have all the intentions, while we have all the imaginations, while we have all the ideas, uh, we simply don't do it because of, in my opinion, uh, reasons that you can just put aside if you dare. And, and that is probably then another way you could uh, translate the formula, uh, is that speed also means that you dare to take risks and that you dare to do things instead of talking too long about planning the space and therefore don't plan it, to dare to take the decision to plan it and see what the outcome of that is, uh, instead of being afraid of not being re-elected before you do it and therefore don't do it, to do it and be brave and face the consequences if it's not kind of good. So I think speed is very relevant for Europe in the sense of if you want to develop, if you want to give your creative people the possibility to contribute to the development of this day, which needs to be done by the young people that will kind of use these spaces that we are planning as architects in the future much more than the older people, because they will disappear at a certain moment of time, you need to be able to make these decisions. And currently I see many people waiting for somebody brave enough to take the decision. And also when you see the leaders of the Europe discussing last weekend about how to solve the crisis, I, I don't know, but I didn't see anybody that said, hey, let's just do something and, and, and see what the result of it is. Uh, we, we are all thinking, we're all defending, we're all kind of waiting to be re-elected or step down it just in, in, in exchange for something that, that nobody's understanding. So I, I really think the speed of decision-making should be applied to Europe. It's a personal 
opinion. I said I have no scientific reason to say it, but it's, it's intuition. I think if you look at, at Asia, uh, how fast can it go? Um, my train uh, um, metaphor w was, of course, a bit of a joke to make it very explicit. Um, but I really think that I can't imagine how fast it could go um, in the future. You, you try to connect uh, too fast to failure. Um, it could also be that the speed and the acceleration of speed would bring a lot of new ideas and a lot of new possibilities and therefore things that you and I can't imagine at this moment of time, um, which could be success instead of failure. So at this moment of time, I would never say that anything could be too fast unless I really experience it myself and unless we all can, in a collective way of making a decision say, okay, now it needs to stop. But I, I really can't imagine where that stop would be. And I think for me as a Dutch guy saying that related to Asia, where they should stop is also extremely arrogant. And, and it, I can't imagine because I'm, I'm not part of, although I work there, although I live there, although I breathe there, and although David might say that I, I try to kind of be Asian and, and maybe also succeed sometimes. Uh, I, I'm not, yeah? so I also can't say it. He's very Asian when I ask him <laughs> hard questions. <laughs> he has picked up an Asian attitude of answering that I can assure you that. Can I offer my take of, of the same question? And, and let me go back a bit. Um, Last weeks, I finally went to see, I was told what's up there in the uh, Chinese pavilion uh, last year at the uh, Shanghai China. Expo, which is an animated version of a very famous drawing. It's called um, On the Riverside in Springtime. And if you know the drawing, it's a very long scroll. And as you go through the drawing, you actually <laughs> has to uh, rotate the scroll. And in a way, the scenery of this landscape of a, of a, um, a city edge where there's a river goes by with the, uh, again, food vendors and, and, and what have you. It's almost like a piece of music in the sense that space was transformed into time as you experienced it. And in a way, that's the the Chinese uh, uh, painting is about uh, we don't have uh, perspective as uh, developed in, uh, in Renaissance. Um, the way these things it's uh, put together, there's always lots of space or cloud between different images. And you just have to put them together in your mind to experience your, your eyes. Uh, are invited to move through the, uh, the scroll. And if, if it's small ones, and just like the, uh, again, the, uh, the riverside um, uh, in a springtime, you need to experience through time you know, the, and in order to understand the whole joy. I guess what I'm trying to say is that, at least from my upbringing, in a way, the Asian way of understanding life, uh, uh, or real, reality, it's always uh, moving. Things are always moving. It's, uh, you always understand uh, things um, through time, uh, even though it's a, a, a drawing as well. You, you, you understand the world better through time. So, um, and, 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 and again, that's exactly what life is about. Uh, for me, the Western architecture, if you think about it, it's all about immortality. While you look back into the, uh, the old ancient Chinese architecture, for instance, you can hardly find uh, much evidence in the sense that they are all uh, timber work rather than definitely like a pyramid, stone. So it, it, you have very little evidence of, of, of what's there. And yet, um, for, for, for the uh, 
the the Asian uh, concepts of of architecture is never really about immortality. It's more about becoming. And if you take Beijing for instance, it has been built up through centuries. It's just not been planned. It's gradually built up. Um, so again, I, I think in a in a sense, the architecture, even though we don't have that character a long time ago. It's always more about becoming, uh, about something that you experience through time. And maybe that's a certain kind of uh, uh, take of that. And in a way, it's also commenting on your, uh, your talk about the, uh, the, the a certain kind of crisis is always about a chance to move forward, mm -hmm. get to get, the Americans would say, to get out of the rut, right, by moving. By moving, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not sure whether I, 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 I answered your question, but that's my take on that. Um, hi. Um, I got a question. Um, is Oma involved in um, cultural projects in China or Hong Kong? Uh, I'm aware, for example, in Hong Kong they're building the cultural district, but uh, <coughs> we're talking here about speed. But that project has been ongoing for years. I was wondering what's if you're involved, and what's your take on it? I didn't show it because it would kind of kill my argument. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true. It already takes 16 years to plan something, and, and we're ending up with 5,000 trees, or maybe 3,000. But uh, that, 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 so it, it's very difficult to comment on it because we went to Hong Kong because of the project, and and we we were very serious in the take we took on it. Uh, here on the first row, uh, Betty, uh, one of my uh, uh, senior architects uh, in, in Hong Kong, uh, was kind of very involved in planning uh, that with Ram and myself. And it, she is from Hong Kong. And, and we really thought that a cultural layer in the one dimensional city of Hong Kong, which is just about business and money, uh, could add something to its competitiveness in the region because Hong Kong was the gateway to China for money and for business, but now there are many gateways and Hong Kong needs to transform into something that is more than just money and shopping and uh, that very one-dimensional thing. And I, we thought that the <coughs> public uh, initiative of planning West Kowloon Cultural District would be an opportunity to add a real cultural layer to it um, I still think it could be, uh, but you already now see it, it's made so politically, it's made so privatized um, that they selected Foster's plan in February. And they released now the new uh, take on the Foster plan in September. Four cultural venues disappeared. Another 150,000 square meters of commercial space was added. Um, uh, uh, the, the waterfront, the, the trees became from 5,000 to 2,000 because 3,000 couldn't be planned because there is a tunnel where traffic needs to go through as fast as possible and you can't put a tree on top of a tunnel. Uh, so there are many, many things why this project takes so long. And again there, uh, if there would be somebody that takes a daring decision to really go for culture, to really go for an extra layer in that city, it would be definitely feasible because all the young people from Hong Kong, and it's again not me, but people like Betty, other people of our office that are here, want it, but nobody dares to take the decision because of bureaucracy, because of all kinds of connections. So you have a huge ambition, nobody really chooses for it, half decision is made, uh, decision is transformed over time again and again, and what do you end up with? So although I was very positive about it, and I really saw it as a chance, and I really also, we went to Hong Kong to, to get it. We were very disappointed when we did it. Um, but understanding the dynamics uh, of the city now better, we were also extremely naive because we went to a new city and we were competing against somebody that was born there and that already worked there for 30 years and had the political con connections you need. Um, 
we thought with that naivety and with kind of the cultural thinking of our office, we could bring that change. Uh, it unfortunately wasn't enough. I'm, I, I still think it's a pity and I'm still disappointed about it. But to answer the first part of your question, yes, we're involved in many cultural projects in China and in Asia. I think of our portfolio, we were able to establish, uh, grow our portfolio from three projects in 2009 to 18 uh, under planning now. Um, uh, the, the cultural part of that is about 40% uh, and that's, that's many in many different countries. And I, I think cultural significance in Asia becomes more and more important and governments pay a lot of attention. And luckily also private parties uh, in Asia start to pay a lot of attention to culture. But what will you do to overcome um, the, the issues that you run in, in Hong Kong? Because you're running quite a few other cultural projects. Mm. Uh, to avoid the situation in Hong Kong, what will you do different? Or can you do different? Or will it be a repetition? What do you think? The, the, the unique situation Hong Kong is in is that it is in a, it, it's in a kind of very dialectic situation uh, still. Yeah? So it's still searching for its new identity. Of course, the handover is more than 10 years ago. Um, but it didn't transform completely yet. Uh, the political influence from mainland China becomes larger, but still everybody is holding on to kind of the, the British decision-making process. That doesn't really give a situation where decisions are taken. So from a Hong Kong perspective, I can't change anything uh, from being an architect, uh, changing that political situation, and therefore maybe I can't influence the West Kowloon Cultural District, but I could be involved in other cultural projects, uh, which I can't show you yet, but we're doing a very important cultural project very soon in that city, I can tell you. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I overcome that problem by not being too ambitious and not being too naive and trying to avoid uh, being part of a political discussion as an architect, which I, in my naivety, uh, thought I could uh, and, and couldn't. But in the other Asian countries, that situation is completely different. I, there is no other territory or country that is comparable to the situation of Hong Kong, uh, even not Macau. Uh, it, it, it's still also very dialectic, but it's not. Um, Maybe uh, it doesn't relate to your question a lot, but we just presented uh, uh, about three months ago another project in Hong Kong which also had a cultural dimension, but was mainly a commercial project. And we, we informally won that competition, um, but we had on our first pages of the book, and people of Rotor are sitting here, the curators, they saw that the, the diagrams too. We had four diagrams on our first page. First one was, um, Hong Kong as being British, China being Chinese, uh, Macau being Portuguese, then kind of one that uh, is in the transformer situation between 87 and, and 97, where it was known that Hong Kong would not be British anymore, but would become Chinese. Then one of the current situation where it's Chinese, but a special territory with all kinds of rules, because if you would transition too fast, everything goes wrong. And then a diagram after 50 years, uh, that special territory being gone, Hong Kong being China. And I presented and I said that, yeah? and I showed this diagram in the presentation. <coughs> and the decision makers in the governments kind of applauded the fact that I dare to say it. I dare to say what everybody knows. Yeah? Hong Kong is going to be part of mainland China in a few decades. <coughs> but we didn't get the project because we dared to say it. And that was a very interesting moment because that was definitely not naive. Uh, we were very specific and we did it on a very, uh, we did it for a very specific reason, namely that we could get rid of this aura that OMA kind of wanted to say something in Hong Kong or wanted to change something in Hong Kong because we spoke it all out, it was gone, and now I can concentrate on projects that really matter and everybody knows who, who we are. 
So it, it maybe says something about the strategy, how to deal with kind of the next cultural project. Let's get rid of the problem that we investigated ourselves and now work on the way everybody does it. Yeah. Okay, um, well, please join me in thanking both Davids for a very fascinating evening. Thank you.